in this to kick us off. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And it's a delight to see that so many people understands the importance of this issue. Um, you know, I'm a civil rights lawyer and I've been in the advocacy community for close to 45 years. And to me, the digital divide is the 21st century civil rights issue of our country. And I'm not exaggerating. The pandemic has done a lot of terrible things to our society and to the world, but it also is, is a time for us to learn some lessons and to see. And what we've seen is the inequities in our society. And there's no one inequity that was so stark as the digital divide. You think of connectivity and most of us take it for granted that we have an iPad, that we're connected to the internet and we can do with all of those little, you know, little p equipments that we have, the phone, the pad, the computer. But a lot of people don't have that. And if you think about it, how we rely, you know, the stark um, inequities in education. We're talking about telehealth. Well, if you're not connected to the internet, how are you going to have telehealth? If you think about ordering your food online because you can't come out, it, the internet and connectivity has become the tool of the 21st century. And what has happened here today is that we've seen the fact that many individuals do not have access to the internet. And so I'm particularly pleased to see that there is so much interest in us addressing this issue now at the beginning when we can do something, when we can really think about the solutions we're gonna have with us to individual, individuals you know, in the conversation. Um, the PUC commissioner, Marta Guzman Acevedes, and Holly Mitchell, the county supervisor for the second district. We also have some of the folks that have already been thinking about this issue. And I will put it out there, the California Community Foundation, this was not our issue a year ago. It is our number one issue today. And we're gonna make sure that the discussion, the debate, the solutions apply to all. And so I am happy that we're beginning this conversation. I'm happy that Jeff Cowan is here, Mr. Communications for as long as I've been around, and that other people who care deeply about this issue are here today. So thank you. We're beginning the conversation. And I turn it over to Jared Barrios, our Executive Vice President and the lead person on the digital divide. Jared. Thank you, Antonia. Uh, we're going to just get right in here. We have a lot to cover uh, on these getting to these root causes of what has resulted in an inequitable system of access to broadband. There are some amazing opportunities for systemic change. Uh, we're going to go quick today. We have a lot of ground to cover in an hour and 15 minutes, and we want this to be a good use of all of your time. So with that, I'm gonna to introduce to you our first speaker, already previewed by Antonia uh, from the California Public Utilities Commission, uh, Commissioner Marta Guzman Aceves. Uh, Commissioner Guzman Aceves was, uh, has been on the CPUC, appointed by Governor Brown in 2016, so five years. She's been a trusted leader on water affordability, conservation, equitable access to clean energy programs, preventing disconnections of basic utilities. She also represents the CPUC on the California Broadband Council. And if I might say, she has been the leading voice for equity in broadband access on the CPUC, and we're delighted she's here with us today. Commissioner. Thank you, Jared, and thank you, Antonia, for all the work that the California Community Foundation is doing to really get at this digital divide. And before I get too deep in the causes, I want to give a really special acknowledgement to what I have seen over this last year, tremendous leadership from the educational community. I cannot tell you how amazing uh, some of these uh, superintendents, principals, and of course, all the IT staff in these school districts uh, up and down the state that have just found 
just tremendous innovation. So I want to give thanks to them, to all the teachers that have made as many students as possible get connected. But let's get to some of these problems. So people are like, California, Silicon Valley's in California. What's the technology issue? As we know, today in California, 11.8 million Californians, they could have infrastructure near them, but they either can't afford it or the service that's near them is really insufficient. And I know we have a speaker later today that's gonna to talk about that difference in infrastructure, that redlining that's happening. 33% of rural households in California have no high-speed internet. And the tribal uh, community in California are most disproportionately impacted, where 24% 20, of their homes are without access. So here's my um, realization over these four years about some of what has caused this now structural uh, redlining to occur in this state. First of all, we stopped treating the internet as a utility. We, uh, at the federal level, there was under the chairman uh, Pai under Trump, a definition change, just that simple. The Trump administration decided to call the internet a non-utility. And the specifics of that are a Title II telecommunication service versus an information service that is under the jurisdiction of the FTC, not the FCC. And so a fundamental thing that we need to get back to under the Biden administration is, let's call it what it is, a basic fundamental necessary utility that should be regulated as a Title II common carrier service, the utility of the internet. Now, we can't always wait for the feds to act. That's why California does a lot of things to lead and lead first. And one of the things that we have the opportunity this year through Senator Caballero's legislation is to look at our fundamental licensing for cable franchises. You may remember back in the day, some of you remember our local governments used to permit these franchises and give everybody uh, ability to serve. And they would make sure that communities across their whole cities would get served and many other things that were put on top of them. This legislation is referred to as DIVCA, and uh, it's got a long acronym, Digital uh, Infrastructure Video Communications Act, something like that. Uh, and Senator Caballero is leading the charge to really make sure that these companies' privilege of receiving these franchises get tied to service for everyone and the same quality of service for everyone. That's another opportunity for us. And finally, building the infrastructure. This is a great year for building infrastructure. Obviously, President Biden is gonna leave the charge and Governor Newsom just announced a $7 billion May revision for more broadband infrastructure. Let's make sure that infrastructure is open access. It can also be publicly owned open access to ensure that the public gets the most out of that fiber infrastructure. We want to see sustainable infrastructure throughout California. And many people think this is just a rural issue. It is not a rural issue. And again, I know you're going to have people talking about this uh, soon, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But we have a lot of old infrastructure in urban parts of California. So that's my pitch. The, the, the pitch is when you leave it all to private enterprise, to the free market economics, what you get is a bunch of donut holes, a bunch of people who live in communities that lack access altogether or that lack good quality service. And you also have these oligopolies where essentially the pricing is controlled amongst them. There's no obligation to have affordable plans for low income customers. And there really is no competition. It's a fallacy. There are only a few counties in California that have more than three providers. It is um, not something many of us are privileged to have. So we need, from my perspective, more obligations from the internet providers that are privileged to provide service in our state. And we need more public infrastructure to really make all of our systems more robust and, and actually have service to everybody. So there, there's a big um, start here, a big jump start with the president and with the governor and with a couple of key pieces of legislation. I didn't get through all of them, but I know all of the great work and coalition building that you are all doing. And I'm so thankful 
for the level of understanding that you see this whole system for what it is. Uh, because many, for many of us, it took us a long time to get to this realization. And this is not something that's anti-enterprise. It's actually with enterprise, but we need that fundamental equity for all Californians. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. And I see Miguel is, is ready to go. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you for your leadership on such an important issue. Uh, my name is Miguel Santana. I'm the president and CEO of the Weingart Foundation. Um, I've been involved in these issues for many, many years and uh, started with Antonia at MALDEF nearly 30 years ago and have experienced both at the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles. I'm also the chair of the Committee for Greater Los Angeles, which was a committee that was established by philanthropy at the beginning of the pandemic, where we really brought to the attention the significant inequities that this crisis was gonna demonstrate, particularly in communities of color. Uh, one of the primary issues we're focusing on is of course the digital divide as was stated earlier. We're also focusing on homelessness and we're releasing a major report on that on Wednesday. So if you're interested in that and the work of the committee, I invite you to go to our website. I, I put the link uh, in the chat. Today, we're very fortunate in that we have two experts in this field. Uh, one who, who looks at these issues um, on a systemic level and another one who's, who's meeting the inequities on the ground. So joining us today, we have Hernan Galbrin, who's the Associate Professor at the Annenberg School for Communication here at USC. Hernan is an internationally recognized expert on internet policy and digital inequality. And also with us is Norma Fernandez. She is the CEO of Everyone On, a national organization dedicated to creating social and economic opportunity by connecting low-income families to affordable internet service and computers and delivering digital skills training. So please uh, welcome these two uh, uh, very uh, important panelists who are gonna talk about this issue. So let me kick off the first question. And that's sort of kind of two things. One is what did this pandemic really demonstrate uh, is systemically uh, wrong with uh, access to technology? And second, kind of the three wishes question, if you had three wishes in trying to eliminate this divide, what would they be? So why don't we start with you, um, Norma? Sure. So certainly when the pandemic hit, it shed light, uh, a negative spotlight, if you will, on the digital divide. Um, certainly there have been organizations both nationally and in California, including Los Angeles, that had been attempting to address the digital divide and actually doing a lot of work towards it, like the California Emerging Technology Fund, Everyone On, Human IT, several other organizations. But I think what the pandemic did was to really open up everyone else's eyes to the issue, right? There was no reason why when the pandemic hit, we were finding ourselves looking at news stories, at video clips, seeing K through 12 students uh, struggling to stay connected. Um, there is no reason why we need to see little kids uh, sitting outside of a McDonald's, of a Taco Bell, to try to access the internet so that they could complete their homework. And so it just shed light on the disparity of the digital divide. Um, and it also exacerbated it, right? Because it let us know that without connectivity at home, without a robust device, without the digital skills that you need, it was going to be hard for anyone to stay connected to their school, uh, to do their telemedicine appointments, to even participate in the census, right? Last year, we saw that the census added an online option. And so clearly it demonstrated that uh, these disparities were being exacerbated, um, you know, from the digital divide to di uh, social, economic, and racial inequities. Now, when I think about, you know, the, the th three things on my wish list, um, one is, uh, is something the CPUC commissioner spoke to, uh, policies that um, have an equity framework that really think about how do we move from deploying internet service 
to, on it, to, to folks that just need it and could pay high prices to a place where everyone has access to robust, high quality internet service. So policies, again, that have an equity framework that really advance digital equity for all. That's one. Two is also funding, right? We've seen a patchwork of funding from cross-sector organizations, from you know federal uh, uh, funding, state and local. Those are all wonderful and they're essential. However, we need to make sure that there is sustainable funding, especially for the organizations that are doing this work on the ground, for the nonprofits that are trying to facilitate internet connectivity, trying to donate devices to low-income families, and most importantly, also trying to deliver digital skills trainings. We know that. Uh, you know, a one-time grant sometimes is unfortunately not going to be enough for organizations that are trying to train hundreds, if not thousands of families to ensure that they're in the best position to harness the power of the internet. And thirdly, we need champions. We need champions that are um, that are cross-sector uh, leaders like CCF and others um, that are generating awareness about this issue. So in Conversations like these are critical, but they're also creating excitement around the need to ensure that we're really fostering digital equity for all. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Galbrin, you, uh, give us your perspective of how the pandemic really exposed this issue. And sort of you have uh, three wishes to really close this gap, what would that look like? Thank you, Miguel. and. Um... Thank you uh, for, for the invitation. It's great to see so many uh, colleagues, friends, uh, students. Um, perhaps what, what I would um, highlight is the pandemic has shown us that not every connection is equal. Not every broadband connection, not every connectivity is the same. And, and we still use digital divide, but I, I like better the use of it's a digital gradation. There's, there's many different gradations of connectivity and opportunities to connect. Uh, and um, what, we, what we saw in the pandemic is that it's just not the same to be connected on a slow smartphone connection in a household where uh, somebody's trying to uh, attend class, another person is trying to do perhaps uh, a, a work meeting. That is just not enough. So it's not a question of just Yes, you're connected. No, you're not connected. There are many levels and gradations of connectivity. For example, in a recent survey we did, we found out that 85% of Californians tells us that they have connectivity at home. Well, that's great, 85%. So one is tempted to think we only have to worry about 15%, but it's actually not true because many of those connections are just the quality is just not good enough, or they can't afford the bill sometimes, but maybe they can't afford the bill the next month. Maybe they don't have enough devices in the household. So there's many, or maybe they have connectivity now because they have an emergency support by the school, by any of the temporary subsidies that were put in place during the pandemic. So um, I think we have to think more systemically about this. And this is not just a quick fix uh, to get through this a uh, unique time during the pandemic, but how do we uh, address this on a systemic basis um, in the long term? And my wish list, perhaps I have, I, I have only one, but it's a big one. So I'll, I'll just have a really big one, which is there's a lot of money now coming into this, this uh, conversation. And that's great. That's a really great and unique uh, window of opportunity. But I really hope that we don't throw the money the same way we've been doing things because the way we need, what we need to connect those who are unconnected or underconnected today is not what we did in the last two or three decades uh, to connect those who are connected today. So we need different approaches. We need to think differently about how infrastructure should be built, how it should be funded, who should build it. And, and also not just think about there's demand for broadband out there that needs to be attended. We should think also of how do we create this demand? How we, uh, how we put together literacy programs? How do we put together community solutions that create the demand for broadband? So um, may, I assume you both follow how this issue is taking place throughout the country. Who has figured it out? Who, when we think about a model that we should aspire to be like in LA County, who, what jurisdiction comes in mind? Uh, Norma. 
Sure. So a couple have come to mind. Um, one is the city of Austin. Uh, the city of Austin years ago created a digital inclusion strategy plan. So similar to a general plan or a community plan that you have to inform the land use uh, policies in the city, they had a digital inclusion strategy plan. And so they actually convened multiple um, govern local government departments, uh, uh, community leaders, organizations, public libraries, public housing agency there to really tackle this issue. And so it was truly a cross-sector collaboration. They established a fund um, that was utilized by these diverse organizations to drive broadband adoption, to get devices out to folks, and also to train uh, folks. So I think that's one model that we can look to. Right now, also, uh, the city of Long Beach here locally, right? They also have an established plan. They've been doing amazing work also also bringing together various policymakers and organizations to really address this at a local level. So I think there are models like that that we could certainly turn to and it's amazing already to know that LA County is coming together with support from the various foundations and also private sector to really do this for ourselves here. So this is exciting. We've been waiting for this for, for quite some time. So we're happy to be part of the conversation and, and to be supporting as well. Thank you, Norma. Dr. Galperin. I, I agree with Norm. I think uh, um, Austin is a great example. Um, I'm following very closely what's happening in New York um, with the $15 a month uh, 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 service uh, requirement. Um, I think also the South Bay uh, cities have done a great job of putting uh, together this consortium for Middle Mile. I'm very excited about Middle Mile and, and, um, and Open Fiber. Uh, where the model is a, is a wholesale model and then private sector can then uh, take care of the last mile. I think uh, uh, South Bay and, and other uh, cities have, uh, are, are going this route. And I think that's, that's something that also has worked quite well in, in Europe. We, 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 we have good examples also from Europe uh, where they, they're coming from a different tradition. They're coming from a, I'm a, I'm a, from a public telecom tradition, but, but still there's some really great examples of that combination of Public funder for for the for the for the backbone and then uh, private uh, operators on the on the last mile. Well, thank you to both of you. Uh, fortunately, we're we're out of time. Uh, we do have our next speaker and next panel. So I want to thank, uh, of course, our commissioner, uh, Dr. Galprin and Norma, for uh, this robust conversation. Look forward to the work ahead. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, someone who we all know, uh, of course, our newest supervisor and keynote speaker, Supervisor Holly Mitchell. Um, Holly Mitchell was recently elected in 2020 um, to the Board of Supervisors. She represents 2 million people in the second district and she, including the neighborhood she grew up in, in Lemur Park, and very frankly, my neighborhood here in West Adams in Los Angeles. Supervisor Mitchell's election to the LA County Board of Supervisors, the latest in a long history of elected service, uh, where she served as the legislature in California in uh, Capitol, first as an assembly member, then as a senator. Um, she authored over 90 bills and was in the forefront of expanding healthcare access, addressing systemic racism, and championing criminal justice reform. Uh, she's been recognized by over 100 different community and business groups, including uh, named as the 2020 Visionary by Oprah Winfrey's O Magazine. So um, it's our pleasure to have our supervisor with us today, Supervisor Holly Mitchell. Hey, Miguel, thank you very much for the invitation, that gracious uh, introduction. I appreciate you. And so good afternoon to each and every one of you. I want to thank the California Community Foundation for today's convening on a really important topic, a topic that um, hopefully most of you have been aware of. And we've been talking about how we find solutions before COVID-19, but certainly given the recent um, highlight on how the digital divide disproportionately impacts certain communities over others. I'm glad that we've gathered together to really talk about solutions. Because you know, as LA emerges from this crisis, from my perspective, perspective, equity must be front and center when determining how to invest new resources, how to prioritize existing resources. Um, from my perspective, those who have been disproportionately harmed, 
are entitled to a disproportionate investment. Ensuring equitable opportunities, whether it be through our educational experiences or career advancement opportunities, again, for the people in these communities have too often been left behind and again are my priority. Putting questions of equity front and center is of vital importance as we look to making decisions about how millions of dollars will be deployed on broadband in the coming months and years. The future of our economy will lean heavily on high growth sectors like clean tech, biotech, and advanced manufacturing, and the growing ecosystem of startups, primarily right here in the second district, where we have the county's first bioscience incubator, all a testament to that ongoing need. An enduring digital divide, fueled in part by inequitable investments in our next generation infrastructure like fiber, have left too many of our communities with internet that is too slow, unreliable, and way too expensive. We have got to take bold action now, or this will continue to be a drag on our economy, a drag on families and kids trying to do their very best in school. So from my perspective, I think we should all be very clear. There are far too many people in LA who don't have reliable, affordable access to high-speed internet. And the digital divide is real, we all know that. A fact that really surprised me, because I was operating based, based off of, I think probably a very antiquated assumption. But according to the LAEDC, as many as 20% of the residents of the second district don't have internet in their home. My assumption was that was based on um, lack of access to fiber, no cabling. The reality is they don't have access to internet in their home because it's just too expensive. That I believe collectively, we all have a responsibility and can fix. The pandemic has led to not only record setting job loss as you all are well aware of, but a loss of learning as well. According to Cal Matters, across urban and rural areas alike, public schools with more students in poverty were far more likely to serve households that lacked a basic broadband connection at home. For the vast majority, the barrier to access, again, is affordability. So we have got to ensure that low cost internet options are available and are of the same quality and connection speed as their more expensive counterparts. It's not helpful to have a hotspot if three kids in your household are all trying to log on to school at the same time and it's unreliable. So the county is working on this issue from multiple fronts that makes me very proud to share, including participating in a two-year study with MIT. Uh, my team is actively working to deploy a last mile broadband demonstration project in the most heavily impacted areas of my district, from Lenox to Florence Firestone and Watts Willowbrook. And we're debating the details of how to address both the immediate crisis and the long-term systems that created it like those discussed by Commissioner uh, uh, Savez earlier. That will likely include stopgap measures like devices and hotspots, working with providers to ensure fair and equitable access to affordable service plans, programs and partnerships focused on digital literacy and opportunity, like the Delete the Divide project announced by the county a few months ago. It's a real investment in infrastructure. This divide is, multi, is a multifaceted problem and will only be resolved through multifaceted problem solving and solutions. And we can do that. Solutions will need to be driven by all stakeholders, public, private, philanthropy, the broader community. And again, all solutions from my perspective must be equity based because more of the same is not a viable option. I wanna thank you all for your engagement and conversation and identifying critical solutions that will support LA County in a meaningful way. I look forward to rolling up my sleeves and working with all of you to deploy affordable broadband countywide and bring an end for the last time to digital divide once and for all. Thanks, Miguel. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to be with you today. Supervisor, thank you so much for those 
inspiring, but yet as always action focused words. And I think we're encouraged by the priorities you're helping to set at the county. So as always appreciate your leadership. And more importantly, we know as you did in the state that um, you, you've learned to navigate and can lead systems change. And so we're encouraged by that and are looking forward to partnering and supporting uh, that work. And I think your words provide uh, the perfect grounding for our next panel, uh, which I'll introduce. But we'll say, I mean, it gets, it gets to such a basic thing as even most recently completing the census, where because a lot of people did not have internet in their home, it was a challenge to try and get people to do 10 minutes filling out a form on their phone. Uh, exactly. And so it's real and it has real impacts because those, those folks need to be counted for us to do what we need to do in the county. They need to be counted and, and more and more as government has transitioned, particularly when I think about the entitlement programs, when state level, county level has transitioned to expecting people to complete um, their um, applications or to update us on, on for asset tests and all those kinds of things for the, the, the entitlement programs, Medi-Cal, CalWorks, CalFresh, you know, we are relying on them um, to be able to access the internet to complete those forms and, you know, going to the public library, which has always been government's fallback when we acknowledge that people don't have it, wasn't an option during um, the pandemic when people were staying safe at home and the libraries were closed. So you're That's right. right in the census, um, but even in their day-to-day -day living as they engage with government, um, the DMV, EDD, oh, <laughs> um, it's all, moved. It's moved right, it just, as I think about it, the, the problem just swells. All yeah. of those are requiring high-speed internet and we need to make sure people have access in their homes. Again, thanks for the invitation Thank today. Thank you, Supervisor. And I wanna invite in uh, our panelists for today. And I'm gonna start by introducing Christopher Mitchell, uh, who has some experience on this issue and shared with me that uh, he's so committed to it that he spent 15 years preparing for today's convening. And so uh, Christopher Mitchell leads the Community Broadband Networks Initiative at the Institute uh, for Local Self-Reliance and is, and is a national expert on community networks and internet access. He runs muninetworks.org and we can plug that in the chat for folks. Uh, where he's uh, helped to build a comprehensive online clearinghouse of information about things local governments are doing in terms of policies to improve internet access. And so I encourage folks to check out that work. Our second panelist is Jackie Baccarat, uh, here in our backyards within the South Bay and, and partly within Supervisor Holly Mitchell's uh, district. Uh, Jackie is the executive director of the South Bay Council of Governments and led a groundbreaking uh, pilot project here uh, in LA County, which is the South Bay Fiber Network, a dedicated fiber optic network across 15 city municipal networks in Los Angeles County. So we're happy to have you, Jackie, and thank you for joining us. And then last uh, is Stephen Chunk, who's chief operator Chief Operating Officer at the uh, LA County Economic Development Corporation or LA EDC, and is also the president of the World Trade Center in Los Angeles. But prior to that, uh, Stephen was the Secretary and uh, General of International Trade and Foreign Affairs for LA Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti. And so we're happy to have this uh, tremendous panel to begin to talk a little bit about what does systems change actually look like? And more importantly, systems change at a local uh, level to really get at that last mile as, a, as the supervisor mentioned. So uh, Chris, I'm gonna turn it over to you and then I'll, I'll let our other panelists also um, kick us off. Thank you. And uh, I didn't realize it. I was thinking my boss is named Stacy Mitchell. And so I'm fortunate to have uh, many years of training and being the second most impressive Mitchell anywhere that I go. So um, I very much appreciate the, the comments from, from Supervisor Mitchell. Uh, I, I would do a lot of work around municipal broadband systems, 
And, and I don't think any of the panelists or speakers previously have made this mistake, but some people will naturally assume that that is a solution for smaller, more rural areas or areas that may be urban, but are lacking in an appropriate infrastructure. And I think it's important to think about this as a solution that could work anywhere with any community that has properly identified its problems and found solutions. Uh, I think that it's important to note we've waited 25 years now for private sector competition for robust investment. And at this point, we really need local governments to take uh, more responsibility in making sure that everyone has the high quality networks that they need. There's about 600 communities that have some level of service in, um, in the United States where the city itself operates or owns the network. About 200 of those are citywide networks. And uh, two of the ones that come up frequently are citywide fiber optic networks in uh, Chattanooga and Wilson, North Carolina. Chattanooga is, is a very impressive network. Uh, it's one of the largest in the United States. But one of the things that really sets it apart was that this summer, during the height of the pandemic, it committed to deliver free, high-quality access to 17,000 families that had children in the, in the free and reduced lunch programs in the schools. They wanted to make sure that, that everyone uh, in the schools could be uh, present and be active. Um, that took a remarkable commitment and that can only come from the kind of local infrastructure that they had built and then prioritizing that to raise the money so that they could commit to that for 10 years. Um, the city of Wilson in North Carolina has also done remarkable things and really targeted that digital divide to make sure that everyone had high quality access, particularly in a region that through no fault of its own has seen real struggles as the economy transitioned away from tobacco and manufacturing. And the city of Wilson has really been able to benefit from its own investments. Now, more locally, Santa Monica has made interesting investments. And one of the things I love about Santa Monica is that they've proved that they can do this without breaking the bank. They've focused on economic development as well. They've been doing it for a long time. They are now delivering high capacity connections to uh, low income housing to make sure that people have an option there of very high quality access. Uh, and they've done it all arguably without spending any of their local dollars because they basically recommitted money they were already spending to spend it in a more intelligent way that would create more community benefits. Um, we've seen areas in which communities have been uh, the center of a population, of a rural population center. You know, it's a town of 10,000 or 25,000. They've solved their needs and then they've moved out to try to help more rural areas with, with their own investments. In San Francisco, we've seen a city use strategic municipal fiber uh, assets in order to work with a private provider. In that case, the company Monkey Brains, which has been doing business up there for, um, for 20 years to deliver very high quality service to public housing. Um, we've seen cities that have worked together to create brand new markets that have 10 uh, operators or more creating real competition. There's all kinds of benefits we're seeing and uh, I could list them for hours at a time, but um, only my wife gets to hear that for the most part. I try to keep it um, cut down for other folks. Thank you, Chris. God bless your wife. Let, hope she keeps listening. That's where good ideas come. Jackie, I want to turn over to you because I believe your leadership and work at the COG uh, is actually a tremendous use case for some of what Chris is talking about. So just wanted to turn it over to you to talk about uh, what you all have done. Well, thank you so much. And I'm delighted to be here. And I agree with, I think, every previous speaker on, on their insights and, and viewpoints. Um, in the South Bay, first of all, let me say the South Bay are the cities in Los Angeles County between the ports and the airports approximately. Uh, we're extremely diverse and we have several disadvantaged communities. And we uh, started before COVID, way before COVID is looking at, at our fiber uh, opportunities as an economic development. We, we sort of tried to follow Santa Monica and um, we ended up creating a fiber ring that is uh, not publicly owned, but we but we were able to get prices for our cities that who were paying something like four thousand dollars a month for less than a gigabit of service. All of our cities are now paying one thousand dollars a month for one gigabit of service, and so it's be, we've made it very affordable for our cities. We were able to invite other public agencies in, so we have tele we have two health agencies: the Beach Cities Health District and and the uh, LA Biomed, which, which is a medical research facility uh, linked to Harbor UCLA General Hospital. 
And then we also have West Basin Municipal Water District and the South Bay Workforce Investment Board is linked with seven of their offices. So we have a, a lot of different opportunities for people to share information on our connected ring network, which connects to all of our city halls. Um, and we used transportation money in order to pay for it because we feel that the fact that, uh, you know, we're talking about the digital divide and things that the trans that the internet is for, it can be used for, but especially, and I think we've learned all learned this from the pandemic, it is now a significant part of our daily life. It's the way we shop, it's the way we travel, it's the way we um, access services. And so we are trying to look at it in that way and look at how our cities can have applications for all of these different um, opportunities to make them more accessible to their residents. We didn't feel, um, we, we agree, let me start with saying, we agree with those that would like, the, the state that would like to get um, broadband service to every single resident. But we don't think that that is going to be a viable strategy that's gonna get it there in a very timely way. And we have put in a proposal for uh, three neighborhood center concepts in our disadvantaged communities. What a neighborhood center would be, we would bring our fiber ring to a place within a neighborhood. That neighborhood center would have electric charging stations so that people could access it on their, on their electric scooters and their electric bikes because it would be in the neighborhood. neighborhood. It would also include, um, it would also include, include I don't know if somebody's talking, it would include the opportunity for people to get the digital literacy that they're looking for in their neighborhood. It would have digital tools for them. So if they didn't have the, the proper equipment, they would have it. They would be able to learn um, how to use it and use it with, with um, to access services. There would be opportunities since we're linked to the Workforce Investment Board, there'd be opportunities to get workforce training right there in the neighborhood. There would be opportunities to get telehealth because we're linked to health institutions. And so we're hoping that we will get funded for these neighborhood centers, which we're calling neighborhood mobility access hubs. And it would be a concept which we think is important to build robust neighborhoods. We'd like to do it in three of our disadvantaged communities, and the most important thing to the Council of Governments is to, is to watch the outcomes. We wanna really record this and let people know how it works when you provide that middle mile to people and, and let them go into their own area and access all of these services. And then they can bring them home when we can get it to the, neighbor, to the, to the homes. So that's our, our innovation. We hope you'll help us um, get the, the kind of funding and, and uh, opportunities we need to do that. And we think it's a concept that could work throughout Los Angeles. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Uh, so Stephen, I'm gonna kick it over to you and, and just say uh, 4,000 square miles, 88 cities, over 10 million people. And Supervisor Mitchell laid down the challenge of we gotta do this all across the county. So I'm gonna turn it over to you to talk about sort of what's forming to try and, and do that. Yeah, Anthony, thank you for, for the invitation. And uh, Supervisor uh, Mitchell absolutely got, got it spot on. And as you're mentioning, it's actually 4,700 square miles, 10.2 million residents, 88 cities, and also over 100 unincorporated regions. So Los Angeles is not like some of the, the other cities that's been mentioned before. We can learn from them, but we're very unique in many ways. With over 140 nationalities represented right here, over 224 different languages, their needs are enormous. Uh, as an example, in 2019, the GDP for Los Angeles County alone was well over $700 billion with a B. If we were a country, we would be the 19th largest economy in the world. This is a mega nation size uh, region. So our solution cannot be one size uh, fits all. And that's why when uh, Supervisor Mitchell was mentioning that we need a multifaceted approach, this is exactly what we're talking about. And I'm glad uh, you, you uh, invited us to, to present a little bit on uh, something that we've been putting together called the LA Deal, the Los Angeles Digital Equity Action League. I wanna focus on the equity and action part. This is a regional consortium and regional community driven consortium that's focused on eliminating the digital divide through a collaborative and multi sectoral approach. And this consortium was established and co led by both LADC and Unite LA, each with decades of experience in convening diverse community state groups, stakeholder groups, and um, to basically help with the prosperity of our Angelinos. So, what we really wanted to do is to focus our efforts on the underserved communities, including all relevant stakeholders in our process, as long as they're genuinely committed to 
eliminating the digital divide in our county. And equity is at the core of this group, this consortium that we're putting together. And the, the goals are really to address some of the issues that have been addressed before. One, broadband infrastructure gaps in low income and underserved communities. Two, internet affordability. Three, digital literacy. Four, access to devices. And five, public policy. We're really focused on action as well. And we've already connected to more than 100 stakeholder organizations from the various sectors. Um, and later this month, we'll begin to convene them in cross-sector working groups to tackle the five major barriers I mentioned earlier to universal adoption of high-speed internet uh, access to, to every Los Angeles County household. So we need everybody to be, uh, this is all hands on deck situation. As I was men mentioning, it's a very dire situation for us. LADC actually conducted a report in partnership with LA County. And what we found is during COVID-19, um, in the first two months of the, the COVID-19 impact, LA County lost over 700,000 jobs. And in the, up, in, the, in the months that followed, we were able to recover some of them. But to this day, we're over 500,000 jobs short from what we were at 2019. And many of these jobs are hitting our communities of color and those very folks that need the job the most. So we really need to make sure that we are working together. And as Jackie and as Chris was mentioning before, there are many great practices and many great examples that we can learn from and we can apply it here. So we've created the LADeal.org. So I'm going to put it in the chat, but LADeal.org, where this website, we're hoping to become a central clearinghouse of current relevant information for all interested parties as a connecting point where people and institutions can engage with us. So again, uh, a, a lot of work that we need to do in LA County. I'm glad to have uh, to see so many people and so many friends uh, that are willing to work on this very issue. And our CEO, uh, Bill Allen, once said, I'm gonna steal his quote, that in the 21st century, no one should be left offline. And this work is going to be pivotal to LADC, to Unite LA, and to everybody here in this, um, uh, this partnership. So I just want to close by saying thank you again, Efrain, and Jared, uh, and CCF for, for your leadership in this really important conversation. Well, I want to thank you all uh, for this. And I know we're pressed on time, but um, what you've shared, I think, is um, very inspiring. And I think also a great call to action. So thanks for rounding us out and, and closing us up, Stephen. Um, we've got about one minute left, but Supervisor, I see, I see you're, still, you're still with us. So I was just wondering in a couple of words, what, what do you think about what these folks have brought and in, in sort of what your priorities are? Well, uh, I've been to uh, several of the COG meetings of her, Jackie, and her presentation, know what they're doing. Of course, I'm going to side with my cousin, uh, Christopher. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I quoted LAEDC's, you know, um, um, report in my own remarks. You know, I, I think what's important is that we all stay committed, that we look at this opportunity as we navigate our way through and out of this dual pandemic, both public health and economic, that we've got the attention of the world. Everyone was impacted by what we've just experienced these last 13, 14 months. And so this is our crack in the door, both in terms of resources and public attention and the energy and interest of, of multiple sectors to come to the table. So Christopher won't be alone in his you know, 15 year trek to figure out both short-term and long-term solutions to getting this done. I think now was the time and please know I intend to continue to be a partner to do all that I can to bring the energy, the intellect, the human capital and the resources of the LA County Board of Supervisors to the table because we've got 10.2 million residents who are relying on us to do so. Thank you very much, uh, Supervisor. And all I can say is, is onward. Let's put some LA people power behind it. Uh, thank you to our panelists again as well. I'm gonna next ha hand it over to my uh, colleague, Amani Fazlula, who is the senior counsel at uh, Common Sense, Digital Equity Council at Common Sense Media, one of the convening partners for today. So Amani, over to you. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm so excited to join everyone here and to give folks a little bit of um, an update on what's happening around broadband policy, both at the federal and, and in various states. Um, but first, I just wanted to note one thing. Everybody has said so much that's absolutely right. 
folks' eyes have been open to the importance of the digital divide. I think, um, sadly, for most of us that are advocates of the closing the digital divide for many years now, um, it wasn't surprising to see the impact of the digital divide during the pandemic and how difficult it was to access things like telemedicine and distance learning. Um, you know, we've been aware of these gaps for many years, and we've been aware of the stopgap solutions like relying on outside the home solutions for students homework gap, as opposed to really digging in and finding a way to connect students at home. So, you know, I think we're at this interesting moment where we've got um, policymakers, both at the federal and state level, really taking notice. Um, and I think also the conversation around equity has been a really important driver in getting folks to understand all the different layers of policy work that must be done to actually close the digital divide and keep it closed. Um, as we all know, the digital divide is a persistent problem. It's one that's going to always exist as long as there are elements of poverty in our society, but also will always exist as the pace of innovation moves forward. We'll always need support for folks to understand how to use technology, the next technology. And now policymakers are starting to really understand the importance of resilience in their communities across the country and making sure that we have access to, you know, resilient access to essential services like uh, social services, like healthcare, like education. To deliver resilient access to these important essential services, we've got to make sure that we've got um, robust access to the underlying infrastructure in our communities. And when we've got pockets of digitally redlined communities, we've got uh, redlined communities out of those essential services, especially during times of crisis. That means for government, it costs even more to serve these communities. It means that you have to rely less on the innovations that are available to you that can help reduce the costs during crisis or just deliver more efficient services um, and instead rely on antiquated methods of delivery. Um, so it's really critical, both just for the folks who are in the, not just for the folks who are in the digital divide, but also for all of those of us that are working on delivering essential services and that are thinking about innovations in different areas. It's really important that we finally end this unequal access to the technology that we need to have. And as we are digging into developing policies to close the digital divide, especially on the infrastructure side, it's important that we keep an eye towards the future. Certainly, we don't want to spend precious government dollars on putting something in the ground that's going to be obsolete within a few years. And so I'm excited to see proposals from the federal level. Uh, President Biden has put together infrastructure proposals that have targeted future-proof infrastructure, that has highlighted the need to have competition, that has embraced the concept of encouraging municipalities and community broadband options on the table, and making sure that there are new entrants that can participate. At the state level, we've just seen a wonderful proposal from Governor Newsom. Similarly, putting, uh, putting uh, investments in infrastructure with an eye towards the future. And these are all really important proposals, not just for the infrastructure and not just for sort of the long-term goals um, to future-proof our networks, um, but also in order to ensure that our redlined communities are no longer redlined. And then also to ensure that we've got multiple choices um, so that when families are seeking to get access to distance learning and and want to use their precious budget on broadband service, that they've got a few low cost options, not just one, but multiple low cost options of high quality service. And that requires fundamental changes to both infrastructure um, as well as competition. Um, so I'm really excited today for our really wonderful pa panel to talk more about the different policies that are in place. Um, but I do wanna note that in addition to having infrastructure and choices in place, um, we'll always need to have an eye towards permanent solutions for digital inclusion. Digital inclusion will require community broadband organizations, anchor institutions, training and IT support. Um, but the cost of digital inclusion can be drawn down if, again, you have high quality uh, broadband in place, you've got competitive and real choices to help drive down the overall costs of monthly service. Um, all of those lead to a more permanent supportive uh, solution for digital inclusion.
So I do think that as we see uh, uh, investments in infrastructure, we shouldn't see them as separate from investments in digital inclusion. Um, high quality infrastructure built out to every part of our community means that we help draw down the costs of long-term digital inclusion programs as well. Thank you. Thank you, Amina, for, can everyone hear me? Very yes. beautiful. Uh, Amina, thank you again for your very sort of insightful and thoughtful comments. And as always, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's great to work with you um, and, uh, in our roles. Uh, my name is Arnie Sowell, and I am the NextGen uh, California NextGen Policy Executive Director. Uh, NextGen is a, a nonprofit organization that uh, was founded by Tom Steyer and works on a range of policy and program uh, issues uh, from climate change to affordable housing, to criminal justice reform, to immigration uh, and other income inequality related um, uh, issues. Universal connectivity, broadband uh, connectivity is one of our priority issues. And it, it came to the fore even more for us at NextGen as we helped to, uh, to staff the governor's task force on uh, economic recovery. Um, I wanted to uh, just uh, to note right off the uh, at the bat that uh, we have a very very distinguished and credential panel who are going to to provide us some policy updates as well as some information on ways to engage more directly on the issue of universal co connectivity. This has been uh, an outstanding uh, program, and uh, I know we're uh, coming a little bit to uh, to a conclusion, uh, but I wanted to make sure that um, uh, the panel that you're about to hear from right now is going to. Uh, provide us some information on ways to engage as well as more information on some of the policy happenings here in the, in the state. I'm going to take a little bit of a liberty uh, and hopefully a forgivable one as the, uh, the panel moderator to shorten the bios just a little bit um, so that we might be able to, to get a question or two in at the, uh, the very end of, of their presentations because I know we are, are pushed, for, uh, pushed for time just a little bit. Um, our first panelist, and I'm going to run through all three of the bios uh, just very quickly. Our, fir our, first by, uh, our first panelist is uh, Ernesto Falcone. Uh, Ernesto is a senior legislative counsel at the Electronic uh, Frontier Foundation and the leader of the Cal Fiber Network. He represents EFF's advocacy on behalf of its members and all consumers for free and open internet before state legislatures and Congress. Our second panelist is Katie Heidorn. And Katie is the executive director of the Insure the Uninsured Project, ITUP. Prior to leading ITUP, Katie served as the government affairs advocate for HealthNet, and as well as a development director and policy lead at the nonprofit California Coverage and Health Initiatives. And she was also in the Brown administration at the California Health and Human Services Agency as the assistant secretary of program and fiscal affairs and health reform. Uh, I should mention that Katie received her master's degree from USC. So I think um, uh, for those uh, LA participants, we can definitely call her uh, an LA region uh, native. Um, and then finally, we have Dr. Michael Mendez, uh, who is an assistant professor of environmental planning and policy at the University of California, Irvine. Uh, Dr. Mendez most recently served as a faculty fellow in sustainability studies and associate research scientist at the Yale School of the Environment. Michael has more than a decade of senior level experience in the public policy and private sectors, where he consulted and actively engaged on the policy making process for the California legislature. Um, and um, he is currently on the Los Angeles Regional Water Quality uh, Control Board. Uh, Dr. Mendez grew up in Port Coima, Silomar, and Lakeview Terrace, where he was surrounded by people uh, resisting environmental racis racism and where he saw firsthand structural inequities and adversities in the built environments for people of color. And I'm gonna ask uh, Ernesto to, uh, to kick us off uh, because I know he has been actively uh, working in the Sacramento region, uh, working on bills, working on budget issues. And so I'm gonna ask Ernesto to please kick us off. Hey, thank you for the introduction. Um, and, and thank you everyone for, for having me here. You know, I think, um, you know, particularly when we talk about the the Los Angeles community and just just the the missed opportunities we have um, in the sense of 
where we should be as a community, as a, as a country, as a, as a state, and where we actually are, are, are really far apart. Um, you know, we, we as a state of California, right, uh, we have some of the largest, most productive global cities in the world, uh, but we don't have a communications infrastructure that represents that. Whereas you compare us to other countries, um, you know, on average, uh, people in Los Angeles pay more than twice uh, on average for broadband service in terms of cost, which is wild in that, um, you know, we don't have the challenges that normally plague broadband access, such as the, you know, what they call the rural, the rural, rural challenge. Um, you know, we have a population density that should yield uh, very cheap, very fast uh, internet. When I say fast, I'm talking about in the gigabit and the 10 gigabit range already. Um, and, and a common misconception that happens in this space is people think, oh, well, like the faster it goes, the more expensive it should become. And, and quite the opposite has happened in the technology and the infrastructure. And this is where, you know, I hope that as you hear me and as I walk you through this, um, you realize just the, the level of injustice that's happening here. Um, the future of the internet, which is really driven by fiber optic wires, uh, fiber optic communications. These are wires that have uh, capacity that is, you know, in, in the range of 10,000 times uh, fold, I mean, in terms of what the, your, your old cable networks can do, right? So, but it's not being ubiquitously deployed. Uh, it's mostly only going to high income neighborhoods uh, and it's mostly only going to the business sector and it's, and it's skipping, right? It's completely avoiding uh, not, not just your low income, but even your middle, your middle income, I would say, uh, communities of, of, of our state. And, and there's a reason for that, and it's not a good reason. And it's really driven by the fact that we relied uh, heavily on the national ISP, the, big, you know, the biggest players such as AT&T and, and Comcast to decide how this service and this infrastructure, a critical service is rolled out. And what they're driven by is, is how do I make money quickly? Uh, and not so much, uh, how do I get everyone connected? Because if it was how I get everyone connected, then their, their, their formula for approach would just be really, very, very different. But what they do is they look at these, these communities and say, can I make a lot of money from them in about three years time? Maybe at most five years time. And that's about uh, the standard kind of um, you know, investor analysis. And uh, this has resulted in this kind of artificial constraint of who gets you know, the kind of the future of the internet, fiber optic uh, connectivity internet speeds of, um, you know, in the multi gigabit range for somewhere in the range of 40 to 60 bucks a month, right? Which, which should, which is about what it is, it is today. And it will get cheaper, you know, as the years go on and faster. Um, but if you don't have that infrastructure, you will never get these speeds. You'll never get these price points. And so the, all the efforts to subsidize and support access uh, for communities that need it most are going to run into this technological barrier that is, that is driven by physics of what is existing in the ground. And so, to the extent that uh, you know a a a a global city um, has the demand you know, in terms of the population, uh, in terms of the, the the need and the demand that's existing there, there's opportunity. There's opportunity to simply look at the your public options, your local options, uh, and and to 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 foster them and to promote them because uh, not only will they probably not only would they be sustainable uh, given the community you're meeting. Um, but you'll be, you'll be able to do things that you just didn't, you didn't realize you could have done a, for a long time from, you know, in the sense of, you know, dirt cheap to free access, uh, in lots of places in order to address, uh, you know, many of your challenges that, that you see when it comes to, you know, there's some sort of internet access available, but they just can't afford it because uh, it's so, it's priced so, so heavily. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, Amina mentioned like, you know, we have a persistent problem. But, but I'm here to suggest that while we have a persistent problem, we have a permanent solution when it comes down to the infrastructure itself. Uh, when you reorient the policy around high capacity networks, networks that are going to be uh, well ahead of the, the needs of people for decades on out, um, you, solve the infra you solve the question of whether you can deliver access. And then it's a question of, of how, um, how, you can, how you can do next. And so I, I am pleased to say uh, Governor Newsom in his budget announcement last week, and this is where we have the fight. All of us have to fight for this. You announced a, a seven billion dollar investment in public infrastructure for uh, for the state to build the infrastructure out for municipalities such as uh, you know any any of your your major cities and rural townships to be a partner in building it out uh, your nonprofits and your cooperatives and notably I mean this is super critical and no money for the big national players and that has to be the case because if you give money to the same players who have given you the digital divide and the problems you have today you will not see a difference in in the results they will simply figure out how to deliver the least profit the most 
and and leave you leave where we are now. So I, I you know, I'm excited about the partnerships and the efforts that are happening here, and ha and EF is very excited to um, join in those efforts. And I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that, uh, Ernesto. And I and, and Katie, I think I want to turn to you next. And I I, I would just sort of preface um, uh, your remarks by just saying when uh, we were on the uh, helping to staff the governor's uh, uh, task force on economic recovery. Uh, every one of the uh, 100 plus members of that task force uh, expressed concern about uh, universal connectivity, uh, particularly with the folks from the health industry, uh, sort of leading that charge and leading a lot of that discussion. And so uh, with that, I'll turn it to you because I know you're gonna talk uh, about the, the gaps as it relates to, to telehealth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you so much um, for for that introduction, and um, and again, just thank you for the the California Community Foundation for uh, for bringing this event to us today. Um, I'm so glad you said that because um, some people look at this and go, well, why health? Why should health be engaged in this? Um, my organization, Ensure the Ensure the Uninsured Project, or ITUP, um, is a 25 year old nonprofit. We've been doing health policy for a long time, promoting coverage. Um, and we actually run regional work groups across the state. Um, and we held these last year during the dark and uh, difficult spikes of the pandemic. And every local health leader we talked to, it sounds like very similar to the conversations you were having at the state level. Um, they really pivoted so quickly from talking about COVID and testing to talking about telehealth and the lack of access to, to um, connectivity. Um, and so I really just appreciate being part of this conversation and allowing you all to learn so much from you about broadband, which really is, I think, a new policy area for many of us in the health industry, um, but is, is just so critical. Um, you know, I, I think as Antonia said at the beginning, um, and it sounds like many of our colleagues across the state, we really believe that um, connectivity and broadband are so critical to um, bridging this digital divide in health. Um, you know, in a post-COVID world, telehealth, virtual care, patient monitoring, health information exchange, really taking healthcare to people and serving them where they wanna be treated is gonna increase the quality and save um, the health system money. So we are really excited about this conversation. Um, but if people don't have access to that technology like phones and tablets and computers, um, if they don't have connectivity, um, everything from broadband to data plans, um, and if they also don't have digital literacy, um, then we can't be good on that promise. So um, I know we're running out of time. So I'm just going to, in sum, say, you know, without robust connectivity, telehealth for everyone and that higher quality care, that more equitable care, that better care coordination, the more efficient and lower cost care, really everything we aspire to have in the health industry, we just can't do it. So um, I'm, I'm so thankful to be here to be part of the conversation, looking forward to partnering with everyone. Um, I've also dropped a few resources into the chat box. I'll drop them in again on telehealth, a super easy to use fact sheet, um, and a couple policy forums. So you can look at telehealth and health information exchanges use cases for broadband. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. And for all those, those resources, Katie, uh, uh, um, uh, they'll come in. Uh, very, very, uh, very handy for everybody to, to have access to that. And I thank you for, uh, for doing that. Uh, uh, Dr. Mendez, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna call you Michael. Uh, uh, I think uh, you're gonna bring us home. And I know that uh, you're gonna talk uh, about issues related to climate and uh, issues related to uh, sustainable agriculture because uh, broadband has a role to play in uh, helping us combat uh, both of those issues as well. And so with that, uh, uh, please. Great, thank you, Arnie, uh, and thank you to the California Community uh, Foundation and uh, the Next Next Gen for this invitation and holding this important uh, convening. And most importantly, always looking at the the, the nexus to uh, issues of climate change, particularly around uh, the importance of expanding broadband and internet access during, after, and before disasters. As we as it's been mentioned several times earlier today, that the COVID nineteen pandemic has shown us the true uh, inequitable impacts of the digital divide. And climate change will only worsen uh, the inequality that stems from it. And it's important to note that existing inequalities that we experience in society will only be exasperated through uh, uh, disasters and climate-induced uh, extreme weather events. As extreme weather events become more frequent and severe, uh, wealthy urban communities uh, with faster, more reliable internet and cell phone access 
will have an easier time of responding to and recovering from uh, disasters. However, as you, uh, Barney, as you mentioned, these rural low-income areas are already vulnerable uh, to these impacts of climate change, such as heat waves, drought, uh, wildfires, um, and can see these impacts uh, intensified without broadband access and, and cellular access. So local and state uh, and federal governments really need to expand and modernize, as has been mentioned, the nation's telecommunications uh, infrastructure in order to prepare for extreme weather events and safeguard our most vulnerable uh, communities. We need to increase broadband uh, internet access nationwide with the goal, of, of course, as has been mentioned, of connecting every household in individual. Uh, we need to update our uh, country's 911, 911 emergency uh, call systems and ensure cellular, uh, cellular uh, communication providers are able to keep up uh, their networks during extreme events such as hurricanes and wildfires. A lack of a uh, uh, broadband access and cellular access during a disaster can make it difficult for individuals to apply for disaster aid, access re uh, disaster recovery services, and receive important emergency information. Um, and more importantly, from our search and rescue efforts to sending out warnings uh, to people to uh, get uh, directions of where to shelter, um, this is uh, facilitated through mobile and broadband access. For example, um, in the aftermath of the, two, uh, the 2017 Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, the island's telecommunications infrastructure was significantly disrupted and left many residents with slow broadband for more than a year after the storm had passed. Similarly, uh, we just saw these similar di uh, disruptions during the extreme wet winter storm um, that, that happened in Texas this year. More than two thirds of Americans own a smartphone. However, 40% of Americans access the internet primarily uh, through mobile phone uh, uh, services. Um, while our phones allow us to receive emergency alerts and evacuation orders quickly, in the context of climate change, mobile networks are becoming highly vulnerable. Oftentimes, uh, telecommunications networks, including cell uh, towers, are not built to withstand uh, uh, severe uh, wildfires and storms. During California's Cap and Woosley uh, wildfires in the year two, 2018, nearly 500 cell uh, to towers went down. And this was also experienced in the Thomas fire and the various fires in Sonoma, particularly for undocumented migrants and migrant farm workers that use their phones to get emergency information, uh, communicate through WhatsApp, particularly when emergency information is not being translated into commonly spoken uh, languages such as Spanish and other indig uh, Southern Mexican indigenous languages. So to conclude, we are now living in a time of a rapidly uh, changing climate. Our infrastructure from our work, uh, roads, schools, to hospitals, to our telecom telecommunications must now be constructed or adapted uh, to serve uh, our communities in the context of rising sea levels, severe storms, floods, heat waves, and wildfires. So thank you and I look forward to talking to you more about this. Michael, thank you for that. Um, I am wondering, do I have time to ask uh, the panelists one question if they provide a very brief response? We are, we are out of time, sir. Uh, I am so yeah. sorry, sorry. I I'm tried the to bad start your garden party. I'm sorry. <laughs> I tried to sneak it in there, Jared. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. So I want to just, I'm going to wrap this up and just say to everybody, thank you. Thank you so much. You're, You're muted, muted Jared. Oh, you are going to be getting an email uh, from us with all the links that you've seen in the chat and to referencing a lot of the uh, reports that you have seen. The last thing I just wanna say is you heard Commissioner Guzman earlier. One of the things she didn't say, but she has said many times before is that she, co she constantly goes to these hearings of the PUC. And even though this is an important issue, like we've all said it is here today, very few people historically have made this a priority. She gets very few people testifying before the PUC on the side of consumers. Our request today is learn this issue and make it a priority in your work and in your community. Thank you all very much for joining. You're on our list. We will keep you up to date about future events that will happen so that you can support the work. Thank you. Have a great one. Bye-bye now.